Welcome to Revive at Home. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, this is week two. I hope you enjoyed last week's video. We were looking at the fullness of God and I wanna carry on talking about the fullness of God today, if that's okay. Let's head to Ephesians once again, Ephesians three. This is the verse we were looking at and I kinda of wanna start here and then lead somewhere a little further. I pray that you be rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. And what's the result of that happening? That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Last week we saw that we can experience the fullness of God when we are rooted in his love and drawing all that goodness from heaven into our lives. And, and what is the fullness of God? Well, we spoke about knowing God's, God's perfect peace. Uh, we spoke about authority and power. We spoke about the fruit of the Spirit in our lives and things like that. But, but I want to kind of push a little bit further towards the fullness of God today. What about experiencing the presence and the glory of God in our lives as well. I love the fact that through the pages of the scriptures, God is experiential. He is to be felt and seen and known and actually kind of does stuff and moves among us. And you have that sense that God is a real person that wants to be around us in all of his fullness in our lives. I think back through um, history, uh, things like uh, the Welsh revival when they experienced the fullness of God. There was a, a miner in the Welsh revival who had been in mining explosions and he said of the Welsh revival, it was, it was as if there was divine debris in the air over the land of Wales during the time of revival because God was there so powerfully. How's about experiencing that divine debris in our own lives? God walking in the room, God resting on a home or maybe on a whole place. I think about the stories of Finney. Uh, Finney was a, a great revivalist and a great man of prayer and he, he, he just rode past a factory on a horse once and as he as he rode past the factory the glory of God hit the factory and workers in the factory began to fall to their knees and things like that to, to carry the fullness of God so much that he is tangibly in a room tangibly around to the point where people change a transform uh, I went into the opticians the other day and the the, the lady that was was talking to us uh, we're saying there's just there's something about you when you sat down there was there was a peace oh to carry the fullness of God so much that it makes people notice uh, Finney another time just walked into a factory and men on other floors of the factory began to fall to their knees as the presence of God became so tangible in the factory and people started to get saved. In the days of revival in Sunderland, there were times when as boats would approach the shore, they would hit a certain uh, uh, a point, you know, a mile out, let's say, I can't remember what it was really, but, and, and as it reached this point, there were times when sailors would drop to their knees because somehow the glory of God was resting over that area. Think of the life of people like Wesley. Wesley was a great man of method. He was a great man of systems. That's why it's called Methodism. He, he, he really set up his followers, I suppose you could say his disciples, into very organized communities. He was a very organized man, a real man of method, uh, but so much so that we often forget that he was a man of tangible fire, 
they described it, didn't they? Wesley's ministry, I think he said, actually, I set myself on fire and the whole world came to watch. And as Wesley would preach in the fields, he was a field preacher, they chucked him out of church buildings. And as he preached, uh, people would be, the old, the old fashioned word was thunderstruck. They'd be, they'd, be, they'd be overwhelmed by the power of God and fall down laughing or crying or repenting. Or, you know, they were thunderstruck by heaven. Young men that would uh, uh, sit in the trees to look over the heads of the crowd as Wesley preached. They'd fall out the trees overwhelmed by the glory of God as a, as a tangible presence hit the field where they were as God turned up. In the days of the Hebridean revival, uh, a beautiful move of God up in Scotland, uh, when his fullness seemed to hit a couple of the islands up there. There were moments when uh, spontaneously uh, a lot of people would just suddenly turn up at the police station. They were under such conviction and didn't know what to do. So they turned up at the police station overwhelmed with a conviction in their souls, asking for help. And the, the policeman had to call in the, the minister to come and help. There were moments when people spontaneously turned up at chapel with their own chairs in hand, having felt to just, just come to church at, at a time when there was no official meeting. The glory of God resting on that beautiful place. There were moments when people like Catherine Coleman in more recent history, she, she would just walk through an airport and there'd be so much chaos from people just thunderstruck by God, overwhelmed by his presence, people getting healed. The, the airport in the end said, Mrs. Miss Coleman, please don't, don't come through the airport. We'll send a car to pick you up from your home and drop you off at the steps of your plane. There's just too much chaos when you turn up. Wow, the tangible, experiential fullness of God moving among us. It's all over the pages of the Bible. It's all over the pages of history. How's about it being all over the pages of our own lives, knowing the fullness of God among us? And so how can we know that fullness? Well, we saw last week, um, the first thing is that we know his fullness when we know his love, when we are kissed by the grace and the mercy of heaven, and we begin to let that fill our lives, then something of the fullness of God begins to explode in our lives. Uh, we must know his love. It's as if as we approach the throne of grace by the, the blood-stained way brought for us and bought for us through the cross of Jesus Christ, his grace and mercy kisses us all the way to the very throne of God. You'll never experience his fullness without knowing that he's your righteousness. He is all mercy. He is all grace. He is all love. He doesn't love you because you're lovely. That, that gets it all the wrong way around. He loves you because you're his and because he is so loving. He can cope with every one of our foibles and weaknesses and wash us of every one of our sins and draw us into the fullness of God. To the point where the Bible uses words like, those who are justified ultimately will find themselves glorified. That's Romans 8. Wow, a remarkable verse. So we need to know the love of God. But what, what about some other things that begin to release the fullness of God? in our lives. Well, one of my favorite verses is Hosea uh, chapter six and verse three. And it says this, let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. That word acknowledge is literally experience. Let's let me read it again with that in place. Let us experience the Lord. Let us press on, press in to experience him. And this is what will happen, it says. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. When we press on to acknowledge him and experience him, it's guaranteed as sure as the sunrise that there will be climate change in our lives. <laughs> I, I think a lot of believers we live in drought as compared to the Bible. Our lives are a little bit more like, say, a wilderness where 
there's a brook of God's goodness, but there's a, there's a lot of spiritual drought and wilderness. And yet God promises thunderstorms, divine debris, cloud bursts of his goodness and his power and his strength and his presence in our lives. I don't know about you, I want to run after that fullness. And here's how we do, it says, press on to acknowledge me, press on to experience me, and there will be a thunderstorm of the goodness of God that hits you as sure as a sunrise it's promised. What does it mean to press on, to, to acknowledge God or to experience him? Well, the short word is pray. Or you might say, seek him. Or you might say, dig into God. Uh, it might be uh, going for long walks and just chatting to God or sitting in your favourite chair with a good cup of coffee, opening the Bible to, to some awesome verses and just meditating and sitting and fiddler, fiddling around the verses is what I always call it. Just sitting with the word of God and letting scripture read you, right? Just filling up on the word of God. Or it might be getting a pad and a pen and and sitting and listening to God and writing what you think he might be saying to you. It might be confessing our sins and repenting, or it might be unburdening ourselves of worries and pain and anxiety. But however you, you word it and however you do it, and you probably need to do all of them at different times, when we seek after God, climate change happens. The wilderness of our barren landscapes adjust as rainfall begins to hit our lives and our homes. If we press on to acknowledge him, it will begin to rain. We need to give time to pray in different ways. Number one, what about in little daily ways? If you really don't have a, a prayer time or I just say a time with God. When I add prayer, people think, I've got to be on my knees. I've got to put my hands together. I've got to go through praying for every missionary I can think of. And all of us just feel <laughs> awful at prayer most of the time. But if we got the understanding that prayer is just hanging out with God, it's, it's, it's laying out the pages of our heart before him and saying, God, I just want you to be in everything. And more than that, even, I just want to know you. That's what prayer really is. We press on to just know him and to do our best in our weak, stumbling way to, to be intimate with him. He promises to release his fullness over our lives. Thunderstorms of his power and his presence, of his mercy and of change. So it might be for some 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. For some, it might be using your morning commute to work to seek God's face. You know, if it's a good long one, I don't mean if it's a three minute walk. Uh, I remember in, in one of my jobs before I went into ministry, I had to shift from using my lunch break to hang out with the guys at work to taking some of them to go and go for a walk with God. I love to walk with God myself. It's my favorite. That's the season I'm in. Uh, I think when it talks about Noah walked with God, uh, you know, and other characters like that in the Bible, I take it literally they went for a walk with God because that's one of the first things we see of God is God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. God wants to walk in the garden of your life in the cool of the day. That would say kind of morning and evening. Just get some time to be with God. And it's different for every single one of us, so I'm loath to put a time on it. But wherever you're at, give daily time to just be with him. Fiddle with the scriptures, meditate on a good one, listen to the Bible on, on, on your phone. I love to do that when I'm walking around. Listen to audio books that stir up your seeking of God. I do that too, I love it. Or just sit and, <laughs> Empty the filing cabinet of your heart in a good chair with a good coffee next to God and just be with him. Maybe some as well, not just pray daily, our daily moments with God. What about some needing to give extra time? Even this week, we've had our Spirit and Word Leaders Summer up in up in Harlan. Some took time out from their jobs, took leave to come and just give two days 
to seek God's face and be in his presence. I go to conference and I don't really go for the conference sessions very often when I travel to a conference. I love the in-between bits. I'll often go to a conference on my own because I love the evenings, the night, the walks in between sessions. I'll often, you'll find me in many conferences, I prefer to sit at the back, not the front, because I'm there with God, not just being entertained by what's happening in the room. It's actually part of my retreat schedule. And you know, I've never set my face to seek him and come away disappointed. The times I've taken out a day, a week, uh, and I, because of the work that I do, I've been able to take out longer times as well. So that, that might only be for some, but if you can, it's a beautiful thing to be able to give a month to go, I'm seeking God for a month. And the more time you can give to press in to experience him, the more it will reign in your life. But I know that's, that's beyond a lot of people, so don't start feeling guilty over that one. God knows exactly what you are supposed to put into your intimacy with him for you to have the thunder bursts of heaven and some of us have to put more in to get the same results because it's just how we're wired to do the things that we do so listen there's grace for your race zero comparison what are you called to do to press into God for specific seasons in this time take some time a day here a day there an hour here an hour there and press in to experience him. But let me end with one other one other thought. For those that really, I know, <laughs> I've been through times in my life, plenty of times when, oh, it's like the Bible is like a big box of Jacob's cream crackers and you've got to eat them all without a glass of water. It's just so dry and boring and I'm feeling so, I've been through times when I felt so low and down spiritually. So all talks about things like prayer and the perceived discipline of it, although I think it's more romance than discipline, but anyway, um, they just make us feel worse. And there are times in your life when you lose all the will to pray. You're like, oh, it's just the worst. Well, here's a thing. If you can just get yourself into a place where the presence of God might be, I think sometimes that's enough pressing in and it'll be the kickstart. Let me tell you a story and end on this. Hope, hopefully it'll encourage you. I remember being in Bible school and I was, I was really quiet. I was really low and pigged off with life and learning and what I was going through. Anybody else get like that? My bottom lip, I was having a pity party. My bottom lip was so big You could have moored a boat against it. I was miserable. And you just don't feel like praying when you're miserable, usually. I'm I'm probably better at that now. I know, rather like the Psalms, have a good whinge, tell God, and then by the end of it, you'll be praising. But I've been through plenty of seasons in my life when I didn't even want to do that. Anybody on my planet? Let's get real. But I was at Bible school, so I had to turn up to a morning worship service every morning. It's just what we had to do. So I thought, I know what I'll do, I'll turn up. I'll lie down on the floor at the back and I could fall asleep. And people will think, if I'm face down, they'll think I'm just being spiritual. I've prostrated myself. I thought, as long as I don't snore, I won't get any complaints. Anyway, I lay on my face at the back of the hall, fully expecting to fall asleep and still feeling quite grumpy. But there was something about being in a room surrounded by worshiping Christians And I began to feel the dew of heaven touch my heart. Oh, the grace of God that even just turning up was enough of a pressing in for God to begin to change the climate. As I lay there on my face, I was taken into what I can only describe as as a vision. And well, I'll do the short story rather than the long one. I found myself before God and uh, stood on a mountaintop and he was shouting, declaring over my life, you are my son, you are my son. And well, the short version is God just transformed me in a moment. Thunderstorms of mercy 
began to kiss my life. A cloudburst of change took place. He lifted me from desert land with a dried up brook and feeling miserable and sorry for myself into a cloudburst of his goodness in a moment. And what had I done? All I'd done is just put myself in the place where grace might at least get to me. Listen, if you're in a place where any talk of giving time to prayer really just makes your heart droop and your shame grow and your sense of, oh, I'm just so low, I can't face it. Do this for me. At least turn up to the place where there are people worshipping before God and let your heart sit and simmer in that place until the warmth begins to get you ready for prayer. There was a time in the Bible when Elijah was so depressed and down, he just fell asleep wishing that he could die. An angel gave him a bit of a kick, said, eat this food. And then he had to, he had to travel for 40 days to the mountain of God to experience a refreshing and a transformation in his life. You know, sometimes you have to journey to the place where you're even ready to begin to be restored and lifted up by God. At least put yourself in the place where, okay, I'm starting my journey back to full restoration, back to fullness. Just start. Do that for us. At least turn up to be in the presence of God so that your heart can begin to simmer with the warmth of heaven. You will find it transforms you so much. So pray, little ways every day. Pray, give extra time to seek him. Pray, just turn up if you're feeling very low right now. Just turn up to be there and to have your senses and longing for God awakened once again. I'm going to put up some discussion questions. Hey, discuss ideas, how to pray, what works for you, what doesn't. Be honest in the room. Uh, all of us struggle to pray, so let's have nobody pretending they're, they're better at this than they really are. They might just be the odd really good prayer, but most people find this hard or even when you get it all set up and it is working you then go into other boring seasons it's like between every mountain top there's a big dark valley and sometimes you have to walk through the boredom of 40 days before you get to the mountain of god and a great uh, a new cloud burst of his fullness in your life talk help each other pray together and leave the room encourage that wherever you are at you can step into seeking god more that the climate would change around you and you'd experience his fullness more than ever before. God bless you. See you next week.